Okay, so tonight we're, we're studying Ezra chapter 4, which you can see from what's behind me on the screen. So I think the first thing we'll do is simply read Ezra chapter 4. So let's read together, shall we? Um, I, think, I think I'll read. Okay, here we go. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's houses of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. In the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes also, Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabal, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in Aramaic script and translated into the Aramaic language. Raham, the commander, and Shish Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to king Artaxerxes in this fashion. From Raham, the commander, Shimshai the scribe and the rest of their companions, representatives of the Dinites, the Apharsathites, the Tarpalites, the people of Persia, and Erek and Babylon as Shushan, the Dehavites and the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapur took captive and settled in the cities of Samaria and the remainder beyond the river and so forth. This is a copy of the letter that they sent him. To King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river and so forth, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. Let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute, or custom, and the king's treasury will be diminished. Now because we received support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore we have sent and informed the king that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, and you will find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces, and that they have incited sedition within the city in former times, for which cause this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. The king sent an answer. To Rahim the commander, to Shimshai the scribe, to the rest of their companions who dwell in Samaria, and to the remainder beyond the river, peace and so forth. The letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me, and I gave the command, and a search has been made, and it was found that this city in former times has revolted against kings and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem who have ruled over all the region beyond the river and tax, tribute, and custom were paid to them. Now give the command to make these men cease that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed now that you do not fail to do this. Why should damage increase to the hurt of the kings? Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rahim, Shimshai the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. Thus the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Okay, so lots of big names there. <laughs> so we're going to look at a couple of things relative to this, and I want to give you a little bit of background first. Um, and I want to do that by, first of all, giving you an idea, conveying a context, really, of the whole Old Testament, 
where this falls time-wise. So I'm going to be away from the microphone for a minute. I'll try not to talk. Uh, I'm going to give you all a timeline here. Hopefully you can read. Good enough. If you want one, I don't have one for you tonight. Um, I will be happy to give you one. This is not something that I did. This is something that I got from a Bible study site. But the general date that it was written, you can ask that. So there's a lot of information on this outline that I am not trying to snow you with details, and I'm also not trying to make the study of Ezra chapter 4 a history lesson. I simply want to point out to you one area, um, which is, if, you, if you're looking at the page, it's kind of the the right-hand side of that upper line. And it says there, in a, it says at the top, the year 722, and it's Assyria conquers northern kingdom of Israel. We're gonna read a little bit about that because that's when the inhabitants of northern Israel, which in the New Testament is called Samaria, or for that matter, the Sea of Galilee is there, the area of Galilee where Christ ministered much of the time is in northern Israel as well. That's where the Samaritans became the quote-unquote half-Jews that, the, Jew, that the, the strict Jews would have nothing to do with. And we'll read about that a little bit. But that's when that started, and we'll talk about that. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out to you here is on the kind of the left-hand side of, um, right over here, okay? Right in this area on your seat, where it says the Babylonian Empire falls to the Persians. And then down here, Cyrus, the Persian king, issues a decree allowing the Jews to, to return to the homeland. That was in the first year of his reign in 538. Okay, so they started building the temple two years later. It says right above that, 536, that's when the temple started to be built. That's the time frame we're generally talking about there. Um, and again, the reason I wanted to show you this is not because I want you to memorize dates or I want this to be a history lesson. Very simply, this timeline really represents redemptive history in the Old Testament of God trying to bring his people to obedience when they didn't obey the consequence for that disobedience, which in this case, and we'll read about this, um, as far back as Deuteronomy, that whole thing of that 722 date over here, that one, that was foretold when Moses was still alive in Deuteronomy chapter 28, that that would happen, that there would be a, a foreign nation come and would carry them away and decimate them and so forth. That was foretold that long ago. So again, this kind of a timeline really just represents redemptive history. What God tried to do to maintain a relationship with his people and their response to that, which we'll read some about, but from what, if you were here when we studied the book of Joshua, for example, um, they never came to the point that they truly believed what God told them to do. They always just assimilated to the surrounding people and ended up in the same idolatrous practice. So there was a consequence for that, obviously. Disobedience, there's a consequence. The consequence in this case was Samaria, the, the people in northern Israel all, all together carried away. So let's read a little bit about that. So you don't have to look too much at this, but I wanted to point those dates out to you and point out that the cycle of obedience and disobedience in the Old Testament is kind of like we obey, we don't obey, there's a consequence. We obey, we don't obey, there's a consequence. And that's just through the entire Old Testament until the very end. Until the very end of the Old Testament, and there's like a 400 year period between when the Old Testament ends as we know it in Malachi and when Jesus Christ arrives on the scene. Okay. So, but that redemptive history is what the Old Testament is really about. God tries to establish a relationship. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, they get carried away, he brings them out, they send them to the promised land, and they assimilate. They just do the same stuff that everybody else is doing. They burn their children to the idols, they do the incest, they do everything, right? So they just assimilate, and there's a consequence for that, and you know they obey for a while, and then there's a consequence for disobedience, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what that timeline really represents. The other thing I think is, um, it's, we're not gonna go into it in detail tonight, but it's good to know Generally speaking, chronologically, um, different time points. And this may help you do that. Develop kind of a framework for what's where in the Old Testament. Uh, 
this time that we're going to read about tonight in Ezra 4 that we're going to study. It's not that long before the end of the Old Testament as we know it, and that 400-year gap that I told you about when before Jesus Christ actually comes on the scene as Messiah. So this is kind of the very end of things here. Right? Anyway, I don't want to go too much into that. Um, this is just background. This is a little bit geeky, so stick with me now, okay? <laughs> Touch geeky. Um, I just wanted to point out to you that um, the book of the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are actually one book in the Hebrew Bible. They're not two books. They're one book. Which this right hand side of the screen here, that's a page out of a current, a modern Hebrew Bible. Okay? And you can see at the top, it's a Latin, it's in Latin. You know, those English letters are actually Latin words. But it says Ezra and Nehemiah, and that's what the Hebrew letters next to it. They say it, but kind of in reverse. You, you read Hebrew from right to left, not from left to right. So that's a page that demonstrates that Ezra and Nehemiah were one book in the Hebrew Bible, not two books, like they are in our Bible. Um, and the other things I just want to mention, and this is a really cool thing, in my opinion. Um, there's a couple of reasons why we know those are one book in the Old Testament. Verses in early printed Hebrew Bibles, they were numbered, like they are in our Bible. So the verses in Ezra and Nehemiah are numbered from the beginning of Ezra all the way to the end of Nehemiah, 685 verses. They're not broken. Okay. The other thing I just want to point out, and don't want to dwell on it too much, it's a little touch on the geeky side, but there were a group of scribes who were entrusted with copying the Hebrew text with integrity from an original to a copy. Okay? They were the ones that did that. And remember, this is before the time of printing. It's not like you could send this to a printer and you could print it out a copy. Anything you had was hand copied. So they were entrusted to do that. The name of those guys was the Nazarites, right up there, Nazarites. So when they made a copy, they had what I would call safeguards. They had ways that they would check the integrity of the copy that they made. Such as they would tell all of the verses in whatever they copied, and they would they would find out what the middle verse was from the original. And then when they made a copy, if they didn't, if it wasn't the same middle verse. They would throw it away and recount it. Okay? They would count that stuff. They would count the number of words. They would determine what the middle word was. So, and the middle verse that they determined for these two books was in Nehemiah 3.32. Okay, so there's 10 chapters in Ezra, and there's 13 in Nehemiah, 23 total chapters, but the middle verse is in Nehemiah. So we know that this was all one book. So I just wanted to point that out because that's different. And the other thing, again, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but I wanted you to know, too, that um, the order of the books in the Hebrew Bible is much different. This is the order of the books in the Hebrew Bible. You may, in the New Testament, they're actually written, or they're actually designated this way, called the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Okay? That's, the Law was... The, the books as we know them, Genesis, section of the creation of the Bible. The prophets were Joshua, Judges, etc., etc., all the way through, right? And then the writings were Psalms, Proverbs, etc., etc. Et so they were here, here, and then these were the last books. So Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles are the last books of the Hebrew Bible, right? So this Ezra, Nehemiah period ends ends the New Testament time. Malachi, you know, is there too. But, and there are a couple of minor prophets that as you read, which I do encourage you to do, by the way, I, read, I encourage you to read Ezra. Just start to get a gestalt. Start to get a kind of an understanding, a skeleton that you can fill in in your understanding. Because Ezra, which if you've read it, you may or not know, Ezra as a person does not appear in the book of Ezra until Ezra chapter 7. The whole, the book of Ezra takes place over like between 15 and 20 years. But Ezra is not there for the first part that we're reading. Ezra's not even in the mix here that we're reading about tonight at all. He's not even there. He doesn't come until later in the book. <clears throat> and you can see that on your timeline. I won't point that out to you now, but you can see that on your timeline later. Anyway, so Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles, those were the last books. Uh, Chronicles was written by Ezra, so far as we know. So just wanted to point that out. Again, that's general stuff. Nothing you need to remember. I'm not trying to snow you with the details. But there's a reason there's a reason these things are the way they are there's a reason that uh, the events in the Old Testament took place like they did because of okay so let's
Let's talk about the origin of the Samaritans a little bit. Um, so in Ezra chapter 4, and you'll want to either turn there. I won't necessarily have these on the screen yet. Ezra chapter 4, and in chapter 4 verse 1, It says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of Gethsemane were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel. So, adversaries, right? That's, they're designated adversaries there. Now look at verse 10. <clears throat> and the rest of the nation, this is in their letter, and the rest of the nations whom the great noble Osmopor took captive and settled in the city of Samaria. Okay? The city of Samaria. There were, so the, the adversaries are the Samaritans. Okay? Those are, when you read context here and read that over, you'll see. They're equated. They're one and the same. The adversaries are Samaritans, right? So Samaria is northern Israel. I don't have a map to show you that, but if you have one in your Bible, you might want to look at that. Samaria is northern Israel. It's still referred to as Samaria today. In fact, when we went to Israel in 2000, they, we did a little bit of sightseeing, you know, uh, biblical sightseeing in Samaria. But that time, this was before, um, not too long before, Outbreak of hostilities between the Israelis, Israelis and Palestinians broke out. But we had to take special precautions to even go into Samaria because it was more Palestinian and they were concerned about her safety. So even then, but anyway, so Samaria is still Samaria today. <clears throat> now, you, I referred to this 722 date Assyria conquers northern kingdom of Israel. So one of the things the Assyrians did. And they, they did this eventually. Um, they were they were vicious in their conquest. Vicious. They would torture. They would um, take people wholesale away from a country, transplant them over into their country, take people from their country, and put them back over. And that's exactly what they did with Samaria. They took all the inhabitants. They carried them away to, to Assyria, which are, by the way, modern Syrian Christians. And that's those are the descendants of Syria, of, of Assyria. <clears throat> and then they took a bunch of people and they put them back over there, right? So, and the Assyrians were absolutely vicious in their conquest. So, let's look at some of that and look at First King, I'm sorry, Second Kings 17. Second Kings 17. Yeah. And you'll want to turn there because I'm not going to have this on the screen. Second Kings 17. This is again the origin of these people who are adversaries for the Israelites that returned from Persia and are building the temple. They are trying to build the temple. So these adversaries come up and they're the Samaritans, so we're seeing how they work. Right? Because as it turns out, they're not they're not Jews. We will start in 2 Kings 17 and in verse 6. We're going to read a little here and just kind of stick with me. If you don't want to you know, read, you can listen. But I'm going to read it. So, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods and had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. Remember I said they assimilated. They went into the country, they were supposed to keep themselves separate, and instead they adopted those same customs. We won't read about it tonight, but they even got to the point that they were burning their own children to idols. If you can imagine ever doing that, that's what they were doing. It's in the book of Psalms. Anyway, let's read on, verse nine. Also the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God, things that were not right, and they built for themselves high places in all their cities. High places means altars to uh, idols. Okay, that's what that's referring to, altars to idols. From watchtower to fortified city, they set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. Uh, those are basically idols and phallic symbols. You know, a phallic symbol is a symbol that resembles a penis. Okay, that's what a phallic symbol is. That was part of the groves, which were part of worshiping idols, because many of the idol worshiping rituals were sexual in nature. Okay, so, and this Israel's doing this, right? After they see 40 years of miracles, 
They go into the promised land and they do that. I'm not going to talk about that anymore right now. Verse 11. There they burned incense on all the high places like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them. And they did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear but stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies which he had testified against them. They followed idols became idolatrous and went after the nations who were all around them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. So they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, made for themselves a molded image and two calves, made a wooden image and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. <coughs> and they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire. That means they burnt their kids. That's what that's talking about. They burnt their kids to idols. Okay? Sacrificed their own children. practiced witchcraft and soothsaying and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. And Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel which they made. And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, afflicted them, and delivered them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them from his sight. For he tore Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. Then Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam which he did, they did not depart from them. Until the Lord removed Israel out of sight, as he had said by all the servants of prophets, so Israel had carried, was carried away from their own land to Assyria, as it is this day. Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. That's the origin of the Samaritans. Now let's look at the Samaritans in the New Testament a little bit. So in Ma and you can just look at these on the screen now. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. This is when Jesus is going to send out the twelve, right? To to spread the gospel, the good news of his messiahship. It says, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans. At that time, he didn't even want them going to the Samaritans yet. Now remember, in John chapter 4, he actually talks and um, brings to a saving knowledge, I guess, of his messiahship, the, a Samaritan woman. That's the woman at the well. She's Samaritan. In fact, she said it. Why are you talking? Well, actually, we'll read it. It's right here. John chapter 4, verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So she says, Wow, you're a Jew? You're talking to me? You guys don't deal with us at all. And these, again, are the adversaries that we read about in Ezra chapter 4. These are the Samaritans. These are the people that, um, at the time of Moses, uh, let's see, about 200 years before this, yeah, about yeah, about 200 years before what we read in Ezra chapter 4 is when Assyria conquers Israel, transplants all the people, puts all new people there. Okay? They're about, they're, been about, they're about 200 years. In Luke chapter 10, verses 30 and 37, is we're not going to read the whole thing. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. The reason the Good Samaritan is in there is because it would have been so weird for the Good Samaritan to do anything good. Right? The, the parable that Jesus tells, he says, go to the street, and he passes by this guy that got beat up, and all this stuff stolen, right? The priest passes by and tell the road. And he says, and there was a Levite. He's that guy, got beat up, everything stolen, he passes by and tell the road. But then the Samaritan comes, and he shows him something. Why was that weird? Because the Samaritans were looking at him. They were happy. The Jews didn't have any dealings. That's the Samaritans we're talking about in Ezra chapter 4. Those are the adversaries. Those are the people that um, Assyria transplanted into there that weren't Jews. And now they see the Jews coming back to build the temple and they want to halt that process. They 
They want to stand in their way. So go to the end and start reading about it in, in Ezra chapter 4, verse 1. That's how they got there. Those are the Samaritans. Okay, so let's stand up and take two minutes and wait. Walk around, shake a hand, say hello to somebody. Do something. There you go. Move them joints. So, those are the adversaries. Now, the narrative that we read in Ezra chapter 4, it stands on its own. It doesn't need a lot of exegesis to understand it. It's basically these Samaritan people standing in the way of the Israelites who came back from under Cyrus edict to go back and build the temple. When they come back, these Samaritans, their adversaries, want to stop them. So we see the letter they wrote. We see the king's response to that. He agrees with them. And he says, you go stop them. So the chapter ends with, they go and forcefully stop the Jews. Now we'll look at some details on that a little later, but right now the concept I want to, to make an analogy to, to what we know of the New Testament as Christians is the concept of an adversary. Because unfortunately, I think, I didn't do any web searches on this to find statistics, but a lot of Christians don't know that they have a personal adversary. They don't know that they have a personal Maybe because they haven't read the Bible. Uh, maybe because if they've read the Bible, they don't understand the Bible. But the idea of a personal adversary is alive and well in the Bible. There's a lot in there about it. There's not a lot in the Old Testament about it. We'll look at that a little bit. But there's a whole bunch in the New Testament about it. After Jesus came and kind of revealed the spiritual world to us, then we understood. In any case, the first scripture we'll look at, or just read, and again, you can turn to these if you want to, if they're on the screen, I don't mind if you don't. Um, yes, the word of the Bible has one. Yes. Um, first Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Okay, so, um, if you've ever seen one of the nature shows of lions hunting, um, they they want the weak and the sick. They want and the weak and children. And the whole Lord thing is not because the Lord is a government thing, other than here the, the victims. That's all they do. I mean, you know, they attack and kill the victims. The Lord just freezes them. But the devil is just like that for us. He's going to look and and the weak and the sickly part for us is translated for Christian believers. It translates into looking for that area of my life where I am most vulnerable. And he thinks he's hit that part. He thinks he's hit. Whatever that is, wherever I'm most vulnerable, he is. He did not practice God's word in my life. He thinks he's in that because he's my personal answer. Um, it's a great point you brought up about the record in of the temptations. We'll read a couple of those in Luke chapter 4. Um, but Jesus had to face the devil face. We don't have to take him face to face, but he's still our first of all the things. He still so arranges things, which for reasons we'll talk about, such that he's going to attack us. So again, just like Ezra 4 1, these adversaries stopping what was essentially the work of God in the temple, we've got one too. All right, so um, this word adversary is the Greek word antidikos. It simply means to be against what is right. That's all it just means to be against what is right. So our adversary against the right. We're not going to read the passages, but if you want to read a little more about how Lucifer got to Lucifer, read Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 is the following, and Ezekiel 28. He 
because we will see that essentially what he wanted to do was he wanted to be God. And that was a no-go. That was a deal breaker. Okay. But you'll read that in those passages if you want to read further. Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Um, 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9. This is a great scripture for a couple of reasons. But let's just talk about it in terms of adversary. So uh, Paul says here, but I, this is Paul writing, 1 Corinthians uh, 16. He's in Ephesus when he writes this. Okay? So he says, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Now he's talking about human adversaries. The only reason I put this scripture up there is look at Paul's perspective. Many times, I have heard Christians many times say, for example, God shut a door. And the reason they will say that is because there was some kind of an obstacle or some kind of an adversary in the way. And they would say, well, God shut that door for me. I'm not going to do that. God shut that door. Look at this scripture and think about Paul's perspective on adversaries. It's just the opposite of that. It's just the opposite of the door was shut. In his, in his mind, I have a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So even though there were adversaries, it was a great and effective door. Okay. So I only point that out because of Paul's perspective as a man of God. In Corinth, a very ungodly city, I'll let you read about that at another time. Very ungodly city, which you can tell from what's in the epistle to Corinth, to the Corinthians. But you can also tell if you want to read a little bit about second ministry. Corinth was Depending on your perspective, it was really, really good or really, really bad, depending on your perspective. Um, so this is the record that um, you refer to, the temptation record. And we'll look at a couple things. Maybe we're not going to read that record. But this word devil, the English word devil, comes from a Greek word which means to accuse. It's sort of like pointing a graphic. And you see this in the temptations, because one of the things he says to Jesus is, if you're the Son of God, just like the devil did in the book of Genesis, just like he did. Well, and then the devil comes back and says, just well. He just flat out calls divine authority, godly um, direction, calls it in question. He says to the Messiah, to the Messiah, he says, if you're the Son of God. Now just think of the gall to even do that. He's the Messiah, for heaven's sake. And you're questioning his sonship? So what's he going to do with you if he does that with Jesus? I mean, of course he's... <laughs> Um, and there were other things in there that we'll look at. Uh, Revelation 12.10, I just thought this was a good uh, scripture in light of the devil as an accuser. It says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now, a good, we're not going to read this record, but a great example of that is, jo is Job chapter 1 and 2. Most that's exactly that's that is the nature of the case here. So a little more on uh, kind of other names or other ways Satan is referred to. One of them is Satan, which is actually a Hebrew word, and it means uh, one who attacks or it means an opponent. Okay, it's first used in Job. I'm sorry, in First Chronicles and then in Job as well. First Chronicles 21.1, now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So Satan, now the reason that was even significant is that when David, he was commanded not to take kind of census to the Jews and sort of kind of number of arms. The reason that was a problem is that you begin to count on your own strength instead of God. Okay. That's why that was a problem. Um, and that's why it says Satan moved him to do that, and that's why it was wrong. Job chapter 1, verse 7, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? This is again, he's the, he's the accuser. He's the one who attacks. He's the opponent. 
God says, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro and from walking back and forth. In it. So what is Satan's habitation? The earth, right? More scriptures on that. 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So who's the God of this age? And this word in the King James Version, this is translated the God of this world. But this word age is a really good translation because in Greek there are several words that can be translated world. One means like the created world, which is the word cosmos, just like the universe. One means um, the inhabited world, like the, the people in the world, so to speak. This word is a word that means kind of like age time. In other words, that make this age distinctive. Why culture in America is the way that it is. You know, cell phones, the internet, pop culture, music, um, the way people dress, drugs, alcohol, all that stuff. That's this age all over the world. How man occupies this time. That's, and he's the God of this age. He's regulated this age. I mean, if you look at the news, you can, But that's why he's referred to as the God of this age. No, so that's the devil. That's our personal adversary. Again, we're, we're this is going back to Ezra 4 1 about the adversary is turned away. We have personal adversaries too. He's going to stand in the way of us to be a Christian. He's going to do that. And then Ephesians 2 2, uh, he's referred to here. It says, In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So he's called the prince of the power of the air. This is all the accuser. This is all Satan. This is all the devil. This is all the one that's going to call us into question as Christians and try to, to be an obstacle to us. So how do you fight such an enemy? Okay, we got a guy who wanted to be God, which he was one of the three archangels, right? There were three archangels. You know, Michael Gabriel Luther, he was an archangel. So he said, you know what? I think I want this. And that was a deal breaker. So he gets to talk to God out with the three of the angels with him. Right? But do you think that an archangel is pretty powerful? Wouldn't you think? So how do we how do we deal with you? How can you stand with him? How do you possibly stand with him? How can you possibly do that? So let's look at that. So uh, Pastor David, a couple of weeks ago, he um, the only way we can stand against the devil, which we'll look at this further, is by using the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We don't have anything else. We have nothing else to stand on. Nothing. If we don't hold God's words in our heart, if we don't read the Bible, I'm not saying you've got to be a Bible scholar. I'm saying God's word has to live in your brain. Because we have no other defense against the devil. Other scriptures related to that. The example of, of uh, Jesus Christ in the, in the wilderness. Um, when he faces the devil head on, he does what? He quotes scripture. He doesn't, he doesn't answer it. He just quotes scripture. That's it. He doesn't reason with it. He just quotes scripture. And this is when, I don't know if you've ever seen... Um, see the pictures that you've been holding on every day. But the Judean wilderness where he was in the temptation is as desperate as it is. And um, this is after 40 days without food. And the devil comes and says, And one of the temptations was, So he didn't mention it. Move on to the next one. Right? He, um, there was in Luke 4, we won't read it, but he says, he, he takes him, he takes him up the mountains, he shows him all the things in the world, the glory of He says, All this I'll give you. He says, It's mine, it's whatever I will I have. All you have to do is keep it. It's all in my hand. Now, Jesus didn't say, Come on, Pastor, it's God. He didn't say that. 
because the devil was right. We read about the fact that he had authority. We read about the fact that he's the God of this age, that he's the prince of the power of the air. He had that authority. He could have done what he said if Jesus fell down and worshipped him. What was part of the problem? Worship God. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Okay. Again, quoted scripture. And then he says, uh, you know, takes him up to a pinnacle of the temple, which the, the temple at that time was very special. It was a magnificent structure. So he puts him on the top and says, you know what? That was special. He quotes from scripture to say it. He quotes it from Psalm 91 and says, God's a temple. He won't take away the stone. He's going to throw it down. And Christ's response to that was, you will not tempt the Lord your God. So Jesus never banters with the devil. He simply quotes it. Scripture. So when we run into an area that the devil may be repeatedly hitting us on, what's the best thing to do? Find the scriptures that deal with that area. I encourage you to not argue because how many rock and roll songs do you think you have? Seriously. I bet you, I bet you, Michael and Shell, I bet you guys remember commercials from when you were kids. Right? I didn't say that. I did not say that. Yes. <laughs> so we memorize lots of I don't know like average numbers of names, phone numbers, verses from songs, rock and roll stuff, limericks when you were kids, your ABCs. Look at all the stuff you memorize. Why not scripture for heaven's sake? I mean, what could be more profitable than scripture to memorize? Really? Anyway, so I encourage you to choose some verses that perhaps deal with the area where you may feel like you have a shortcoming and memorize those scriptures and have some ammunition ready when that attack comes. Because the question is not going to be when the attack comes, the question is when. So if you're prepared, so much the better. If you're not, so much the worse. Uh, before we finish up, let's see. Uh, we'll finish this scripture and then we'll stand up there. Hebrews 4.12 is a great scripture. Uh, for the word of God is great and powerful and sharper than any two of sword, piercing even the dividing center of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, is an discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And this word, um, discerner, is the, is the Greek word kritikos. We get the English word critical from this word. It means to discriminate or to be decisive. It means to divide one between the other. In other words, our ability to determine right and wrong is dependent on how do we apply, how do we apply God's word in our life. It is our rule of the If we don't have that, we don't have a way to discern. We don't have a way to be critical. We don't have a way to decide what's right and wrong if we don't know God's word. We don't have that. And this thoughts is deliberation. It's just, you know, what you think about day to day. And intense is moral understanding. Now, before we go to the next one, uh, once again, everybody stand up. Greet somebody different this time that you didn't greet before. I don't care who it is. Okay, Jets, here we go. So the way we fight such an enemy as the devil, our first adversary, is the only way to do that is by the real word of God to the degree that it is in our hearts and lives. And you can have a Bible, a dust covered Bible at all, and that can help you one bit. It's a better thing to work at to some degree. I'm not saying you have to read Bible. If the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, if his defense was for you God's work, then I dare say that's what we should be doing. Right? There isn't a better.
better way to go. Um, I wanted to bring this up because I as men, got to get those words in there so God can do his job. That's what that, the truth of that verse really means. Uh, the, one other thing about uh, Ezra chapter 4. <laughs> that this is pretty cool. It's Ezra chapter 4 verse 5. And it's, um, they had these, the adversaries, they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. All the days of Cyrus King of Persia, even until the reign of Darius King of Persia. Okay, two things. Number one, the word counselors, 
<laughs> means a Bible. So essentially, they hired some the The other thing, though, is the decree by Cyrus, which, and you can look back at your little timeline if you want to see this, but remember, Cyrus became the king in 538. So he gives the edict, you guys, Jews, go back to Jerusalem and build the temple, right? 538. They start doing that according to Ezra chapter 3, verse 8. They start doing that in his second year, all right? In the second year they were there, right? So that's 538, right? Now, just stick with me on some numbers here, okay? So Cyrus reigns for seven years. And then they start the work in the second year, or the second month of the second year of coming back, Ezra 3 8. Cambyses, who is his son, then succeeds Cyrus and reigns for seven and a half more years, right? And then another ruler by the name of Pseudo Smyrtus, he reigned for only seven months. And then Darius reigned. Is, and it says in that scripture we just read, Ezra 4, 5, they frustrated their purpose all the days of Cyrus, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So how many years is that? All of Cyrus' years, all of Cambyses' son, all of this pseudo spurtus and then in Darius' first year. So for about, if you add those up, for about 13 or 14 years, they obstructed this work. Which is why when we read Ezra, it's not just like all this happens in an afternoon or in a week or in a year. We read it on a record that took 15 or 20 years. 13 or 14 of it was just the adversary obstructing the purposes of God. Uh, so, life lessons. First of all, if you have a personal adversary. If you didn't know that already, you do. Okay? Number one. Number two, her adversary does not want you to succeed. He is the accuser. He is the opponent. He is the one that's going to um, accuse you to the brethren, right? Like Revelation 12, 10 talks about. And then the only we way we can succeed in defending ourselves, in standing up for that, is to stand up for that. There is no other way. You don't have that. Um, and that's all. So I'll close with prayer. Anybody's got questions? Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. We thank you once again for your word and the lessons that we can learn from it. Um, thank you again for the opportunity, privilege, and honor to share your word for these men and their taking the time to be here tonight. We thank you uh, for, again, for all your goodness to us. In the name of Jesus Christ.